All right, let's go to Romans 10. I want to preach today on the topic of calling upon the name of the Lord, just because I think it's a very, um, it, it's, a, it's an important topic for those of us who are going soul winning. Um, and and why, why do we invite people to pray and, and ask for salvation and call upon the name of the Lord? There's a, there's a lot of um, debate over this topic. And it's one, if you've watched the videos where I gave an account of when I was at Faithful Word uh, Baptist Church, it, it was even something that was debated back seven years ago when I was back at Faithful Word. People were discussing, you know, is, is, it, is it necessary for somebody to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, or is it just enough for them to believe? Uh, and there's the discussion on what does it mean to believe? Does believe include calling upon the name of the Lord? Can somebody believe without calling upon the name of the Lord? So there's all these different positions. So I'll, I'll talk about this today and I'll try and clear up what my position is. You may not agree with this. This is what I believe the scriptures teach. But it, it's just interesting that it's, it's something that's, that's been debated for a long time. And people that are, you know, have been soul winning for a long time still don't agree on this topic. And it's not that it's, it's a topic uh, that, that, is, that is primary in the sense that if somebody does, believes one way about this topic, doesn't mean they're not saved. You know, it's not one of those. But I think it's important because it's really close to the heart of soul winning. This is why people get... Uh, get very passionate about it because the churches that we know and we're involved in, you know, they, they want to go soul winning. They want to make sure that their soul winning method is right. And, and that's why it's, it's something that people debate about because they want to know that they're soul winning the right way. And when they lead somebody to Christ, have they done it the right way? Now, my position is, just to, just to uh, tell you right out of the gate, my position is, is that it is necessary for somebody to call upon the name of the Lord. I think it is part of the steps to salvation, in a sense, that when we believe that that then is manifested in calling upon the name of the Lord, the, the response to that is that somebody calls upon the name of the Lord. So I do believe it is something that is necessary. It's not that somebody believes and then they're saved somehow by by you know, just internally affirming the facts about Jesus and having no communication with God at all. And then they, they call upon the Lord or we ask them to pray just as an optional extra. Right? Because if the person's already saved, you know, and this is the steps that people take, if they say, well, it doesn't require calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved, then when they go soul winning, they start saying, well, what's the point of asking people to pray if they're already saved? So it does, you see, it does affect the way in which you, which you go soul winning. Now, we'll start at Romans 10, because really this is the, the, the crucial passage, really, that people are debating over. And to me, this is the clearest passage where the Bible actually teaches that the two go hand in hand. When somebody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will call upon him in faith. So we'll start from Romans uh, 10, verse 8. It says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, <coughs> even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And I wanted you to see as we read through Romans 10, that really, it, it, even though I believe one follows the other in terms of you believe and then because you believe, you call upon the name of the Lord, it's almost used interchangeably within this passage. It goes back between belief and calling upon the name of the Lord. Uh, it says, but what say the word is neither even in thy mouth and in thy heart. So you see there the two go hand in hand. That is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you can see here that it's building on top of this. Verse 9 says you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart. Verse 10 then says that again, that you believe unto righteousness, and then with the mouth this confession is made unto salvation. Right? We're talking about salvation here. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So isn't it interesting that it says here that it's quoting the scripture, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, but what it's referring to is that you believe in your heart and, the mouth is, uh, uh, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And look at this, that's verse 11. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all, look at this, is rich unto all that call upon him. So you see how it's just going back and forth between believing, calling upon him, because I believe these two go hand in hand. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So now what we're reading here from verse 13 onwards are the clear, it's the, it's the clear process that, that somebody goes through in order to be saved, right? They call upon him to be saved. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So we believe in him. And then after that, the response is we call upon him to be saved. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So Romans 10 really is the clearest passage that gives us this process that somebody goes through in order to be saved, that somebody goes to preach the gospel, then somebody hears the gospel, and upon hearing the gospel, it says later on that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So because they hear the gospel, they believe the gospel, and then in response to believing the gospel, they call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. So we see here that belief does come first, right? So it says here that they, they call upon the Lord to be saved, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So belief does come first, but I believe that immediately after that, like in hand in hand, like one happens as soon as the other happens, is that the person then calls upon the Lord to be saved when they believed. And I, I think it's a bit like repentance and faith in the sense that these two go hand in hand, but one does come before the other. Like you change your mind first and then you believe on Jesus, and then you believe on Jesus, you call upon the Lord to be saved. Even though it's all part of that same event, that believing on Him is that whole event of turning from what you believed before, believing on Him, and believing on Him then manifests itself by calling upon Him. Now, Romans 10 is the clearest passage that gives us these steps and really drills in that these two are, are hand in hand, that we believe and we call upon the Lord. But this is not the only passage. There are, there are other passages in the Bible and even in the Old Testament that shows us that calling upon the name of the Lord is involved in being saved. And we'll just go to those really quickly. I'll show you a couple. Psalms 55, verse 16 is one. Look at this. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Um, Psalm 86, 5. Look at this. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. Right? So he's, he's ready to forgive. Why? Because he's waiting for people to come to him, to call upon him. Right? And plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Um, let's go to another one in Psalms 116, verse 13. Look at this. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So, you know, when we believe, right, we believe we receive salvation and then it's manifested by calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what we do when we believe. Um, now let's go into the New Testament. We've got a few passages there that clearly link calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. We already read Romans 10. Uh, this is Acts 2.21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we know that, you know, salvation isn't, you know, a two, three step process, but there are different elements involved in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But these are not multiple separate steps that happen. These are things that somebody just goes through when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why you have some passages that say repentance only, because when, when somebody has repented, they've believed on Jesus and they've called upon the Lord. There are some passages that say believe only, and there are some passages that say call upon the Lord only, because all of them are part of this, this same event. They're just coming at it from different angles. Uh, let's go to Acts 22. Acts 22, 16. And now this is uh, Paul recounting when he was on the road to Damascus and then he goes to the house of Ananias and then Ananias lays his hands on him and he receives his sight and baptizes him. Well, here in Acts 22, we, we learn another thing that Ananias said to Paul. He says, and now why tarriest thou? Like, why are you waiting or why are you delaying? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So there is a recognition here, even from believers, that in, in order to be saved, they, they call upon the name of the Lord. That's how they wash their sins away. And it's through faith, 
right, that they call upon the name of the Lord. So that's why it's not wrong either to say that salvation is by faith, because through faith we come to Jesus by calling on the name of the Lord. Um, and we even see some passages here, and I, you may be already familiar with these passages, where we see that even, but like, it's almost as if believers, it's in, when, when believers are recognized, it's almost interchangeable that they are called people that call upon the name of the Lord because that's what a believer is. It's somebody that has called upon the name of the Lord. Uh, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So Paul is addressing this this letter to the people at Corinth and all believers, but he says it's all to every believer everywhere. But it's interesting that he says that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, almost interchangeably saying, hey, those that believe on Jesus are those that call upon his name. And even if we go back to Acts 9, which is the actual event where Ananias is talking to Paul and, uh, you know, he gets that vision where uh, you know, God tells him that Paul is going to come to him and he's kind of scared because he's like, hey, this is the guy that is persecuting everybody uh, and killing them and dragging them off to jail. Uh, let's go there. Acts 9.13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. So you can see how it's, it's, it's sort of interchangeably used because those that have believed on Jesus Christ have called upon him to be saved. Now let's go through some of the objections because probably some of you guys are thinking through this. And obviously, it's a, like I try to rack my brain going through all the different scenarios and everything. I'm sure there are things that you guys would be thinking about that I haven't covered in this sermon, but I'm just covering the ones that I'm familiar with and I'll uh, give you my take on, on these different objections of people that say, no, calling upon the name of the Lord is just optional. It's not, um, it's not required. Now, I think the first one that I think is most out there are the people that say, no, you, sh you don't have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved because calling upon the name of the Lord is actually works. If you, if, you, if you have to do anything other than believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that would include you know, praying to God, then that is work salvation in order to call upon the Lord to receive salvation. Now we know from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that salvation is a gift and it's not of works, right? So they, they have the right intention there. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So something can't be a gift if it's by works. So if calling upon God or asking for that, for that gift is works, then it's no longer a gift, right? So God can't say that you ask for, for a gift from God and it still be a gift, right? Now it's a reward, now it's a wage. But yet we have examples in the Bible where people are asking for things and yet God still refers to it as a gift. Why? Because asking for something or calling upon somebody to receive something doesn't mean that you're working for it. That's not what works. Doesn't mean that you don't do something because even faith is something you do. But that doesn't mean that you are earning the gift, that you have merited that gift because of that act that you have done. Now, the first one we'll go to here. So I think it's pretty easy to prove from the Bible that calling upon God, calling upon the name of the Lord is not works. And the first example is the woman at the well in John 4. I'll just skip down for sake of time. But basically, there's the woman of Samaria that is at the well. It says here, There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So he's saying Jews don't want anything to do with Samaritans. Why are you asking me to get you some water out of the well? Look at this. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So you see how he's saying to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, Give me to drink, you would ask him, 
and he would give you living water. It's not that you've earned the living water. It's not that you've worked for the living water. It's that if you ask him, he will give you that gift of God, which is the living water. So we see here that asking for something doesn't mean that you've worked for it, that it's no longer a gift. Now, uh, let's go to another passage <coughs> in Matthew 7, verse 7. Here's another one, famous passage where uh, Jesus is uh, preaching the Sermon on the Mount here. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So we see here the exhortation that we, if we want something, we ask for it, right? If we want to seek for something, we, if we want to find something, we need to seek it. If we want a door to be open, we need to knock, right? The door doesn't just open of its own accord. Um, or what man is there, look at this, or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, so you see how somebody's requesting something from somebody, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So you see how it's very clear that it's not works in order to call upon the Lord to be saved. Um, if, we, if we request something of somebody, it's not that we are earning it or we've somehow merited that. We are simply coming to them for what they are giving to us by grace. And that's how salvation works. Salvation, remember in Psalms, he's ready to forgive to all that call upon him. God has done the work. He's, he's made the payment, but he's waiting for people to call upon him, to believe on him, right? It's, it's one and the same. When we believe, then we will call upon him and, and put our faith in him to be saved. Now, the other hypothetical situation, this one's a bit more complicated, but <coughs> people will say that, well, what about the hypothetical that somebody can believe because you can believe something without communicating to another person, right? So you can accept a fact, you can believe that it's true and then you're not saying it's a lie. You believe it, that you're saved at that point without calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, I believe that's all that is. I, I believe this is just a hypothetical that exists in the sense that nobody that be actually believes on Jesus Christ doesn't call upon him. And I think that's what Romans 10 is actually teaching. And this is why Romans 10 goes back and forth between when we believe, we believe with the heart, we confess with our mouth, because these go hand in hand. They're, they're not the separate events where one can happen and then the other doesn't happen. So this hypothetical that somebody can believe on the Lord and yet not communicate with him at all, that doesn't exist. Because when somebody believes on him, like we read from Romans 10, they will communicate with God. You know, this is the thing. Like people say, like, can I believe on Jesus Christ without calling upon him? No, because when you believe on Jesus Christ, you will communicate with him. They, they go hand in hand. And the reason why I don't think somebody can believe, believe in Jesus and not call upon him because Romans 10 makes it very clear that we are saved after we call upon him. So we have the problem here. If somebody believes that, well, if I believe in him without calling, but then I'm saved, then the question is, well, why is this step even here? Like, why does it say in Romans 10, 13, that you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and then in order to call upon him, you need to believe on him first. There's a, there's, a pro, there's a process here in terms of one happens before the other. So you either have two positions, right? Because you can't have a position where somebody's already saved when they believe because you know that salvation comes after the calling according to Romans 10, right? So if, if they're already saved, then it should be, well, whosoever believeth in him shall be saved how then shall they believe in him if they've not heard and it should just skip that because they're already they're already saved but it doesn't it, it shows us here that you call upon him to be saved and then you call upon him because you've believed in him so what are the two positions i think there are two positions then that you can take one is that believing in him and calling upon him are like two sides of the same coin and they they're the same action just described from two, two different point of views now, I don't think that's the case because if it was, then one can't happen after the other. And I think Romans 10 clearly shows that one does happen after the other. But rather than somebody being in a state where they believe and then they're not saved, what I believe the right position is, is that calling upon him always happens right after somebody believes on him. So when they believe on him, they will call upon him. And the hypothetical where somebody believes and they haven't called upon him doesn't actually 
exists. So what my position is, one always uh, leads to the other. And I think that's what Romans 10 is actually teaching. It's teaching this concept that when somebody believes, they'll call upon him, they, they go hand in hand. And I've sort of, sort of touched on that. I won't sort of keep uh, talking about that. But let's go to some other passages. 2 Corinthians 4, where we see here that faith does manifest in words. If, if you believe something, you will say something, right? It's just, this is, how, this is what the Bible teaches here. We having the same spirit of faith, this is Paul writing here, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. See, because you can't really believe anything without saying anything. You, you say something to yourself. That's how, that's how our faith is manifest. We know what people believe because of what they say. And this is this teaching of the Bible here that when we believe, we will say something. It's just only the difference is with salvation, we say something to somebody because we are believing on somebody, not just believing a fact. Because when you just believe a fact, you say that to yourself, I believe this. But when you're believing in somebody, you're not just saying something to yourself, you're communicating to them that you believe on them. Uh, let's go to Matthew 12. We'll show uh, just another passage here. It says, O generation of vipers, so this is Jesus rebuking the Pharisees here, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So we see here again the link between what we say and what we believe. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the tr evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So it's interesting that we're justified, right? And we're condemned by our faith, whether we have faith or not. But here it's saying, well, we're justified or condemned by our words. Why? Because words, faith is manifested in words, right? So words is what faith is made out of. When we, have, when we have faith in something, it's because we're saying something that we believe. So faith manifests itself in words, but faith in a person manifests in words to that person. That's why when we believe on Jesus Christ, we have faith in him, we will call upon him because that's how the faith in that person manifests. If I have faith in Michael, then that's, I'm communicating that I have faith in Michael, right? To him. Otherwise, well, who, who, which Michael am I putting my faith in, you know? So faith manifests itself in words. Faith in a person manifests in words to that person. That's why we are calling upon him. So I don't believe salvation is just communication between the believer and the soul winner, right? Like when somebody says, when somebody, when somebody just says to me, like, oh, you know, yes, I accept that that's true. And then there's purely only communication between the person that's listening and the person that's explaining to them. There's, there's no salvation there yet because they haven't communicated anything to God. Or if somebody just communicates to themselves, right? If they just say to themselves, if it's even possible, right? Like if somebody can believe and just do this, which I don't think is possible, but if somebody just communicated with himself, that's not salvation either. Salvation is when the person communicates to God, right? There's a connection between them and the invisible God where they call upon him and that happens at the point where they believe on him. And we don't always see that, right? We don't always see when somebody uh, calls upon the Lord. Now I want to show you some interesting passages here in John, in uh, John 6.35. where Jesus actually interchanges coming to him with believing on him, right? Where we believe on him, it's not just something we internally affirm to ourselves. It's something when we believe on him, we're actually going to him for salvation. And what's the only way you can go to somebody who's invisible? Well, you can, the only way you can go to him is you can call upon him, right? Because you can't actually go and visit him. The way you go to God, you come to Jesus, is you call upon him. You let him know that you believe on him and that, that you want to be saved. Uh, look at this, John 6, 35. And Jesus said unto, him, said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And look at this. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me 
I will in no wise cast out. So we know that this is a passage that's referring to stuff. When we come to Jesus, he won't cast us out. If we believe on him, he will not forsake us. He won't turn us away. But believing on him is coming to him. But then how do you come to somebody that you can't see? Well, you call upon him. That's why when you believe on him, you will call upon him. So really that leaves us with... Uh, I'll, I'll just show you a couple of others. Sorry, I didn't uh, finish this thought. John 7... 37. Look at this. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cr cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Right? So it's, that's like a, 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 like a reference to salvation, right? That we are spiritually thirsty. We need water. We come to him to drink. And then he says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So that living water that he's referring to is the Holy Spirit, that when we believe on him, when we come to him to drink, we will receive that living water, that Holy Spirit. Now look at this, when we compare this to Luke, it's interesting. <coughs> we already read the passage in Matthew, where it's asking, ye shall receive, seeking, ye shall find. And then he says, if any man have a son and asks a fish, or we'd give him a you know, stone and that. And he says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give good things to them that ask him? Now, if you look at that same parallel passage in Luke 11, Jesus says, and I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, so it sounds familiar, right? Will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? It, look at this. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So you see how that when we come to Jesus to drink, right? We, we, if we come to him, we won't hunger. We come to him, we won't thirst. We come to him to drink. He'll give us the living water. The living water is that Holy Spirit that he gives to those that believe on him. And here it's saying, if you ask of God, he'll give the Holy Spirit right, to them that ask him. Right? So it's all sort of intertwined because when we believe on the Lord, we call upon him and that's how we receive salvation. So the people that say, well, you believe, but you don't have to, to call upon him, you know, to be sa but you're saved anyway. My, my opinion is those people are either not, they don't actually believe, and therefore they're not saved, right? Because if you believe, you would have called. So if somebody's saying, oh, I believe, but I didn't call, then they either don't really believe. Or the other scenario, I think, is they're unaware that they called upon the Lord, right? So they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They did call upon the Lord, but they're unaware that they did. And the reason why generally they're unaware that they called upon the Lord at the time they believed on the Lord, right? They communicated to God saying something is because they think that calling upon the Lord comes in a certain specific manner, right? And what do I mean by that? They'll say things like, well, when I believed on Jesus Christ, I didn't say the sinner's prayer. What do they mean? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't repeat the words that are on the back of the gospel track. So that I'm, I'm saved. Or they'll say something like, you know, I didn't pray out loud when I got saved. You know, I just, I just said something internally. So did I call upon the name of the Lord? Because the Bible says, you know, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that you say it audibly because obviously you can call upon God in your heart. You know, the Bible says the, eight, the, the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. So you can speak things in your heart. Even in Romans 10, it says, say not in thine heart. I didn't go to that verse, but in verse 6, you know, should we go there to find the word and whatnot? So either they, either they don't really believe, right? Which, you know, if they believe, they would have called. Or, or I think what normally happens is people are unaware that they did actually call upon the Lord because they think, well, I didn't say this in his prayer. I didn't pray out loud. Or they might say, but I didn't pray with somebody, right? So I didn't pray. I didn't call upon the Lord. Or they say, well, but I didn't ask for salvation. I just told Jesus I believe. Right? So they say, like, well, I didn't ask for anything. I just, I just confessed. Right? Um, so what I, what I try and explain to you is it, it, there's not like some specific way in which people call upon the Lord. Yes, we're given some examples where we ask for the gift, where we come to Jesus, but we see in the Bible all sorts of ways people call upon 
the name of the Lord, that's not necessarily requesting it. And, and we can look at some examples uh, really quick. Uh, in Luke 18, verse 10, we see here the, the publican and the Pharisee. Two men went, went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men, are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not, so, uh, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Right, so is he saying, please give me eternal life? No, he's just saying, be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, what's another one? We can see here in Luke 23, 39, where the thief on the cross next to Jesus is, and one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now what's funny about this passage is that you don't even have to say something doctrinally sound to God. You just, you just call upon him and he's saying, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And it's like, what, thousands of years later, right? When Jesus actually comes into his kingdom, that's when he's asking Jesus to remember you? No, but Jesus knows the intent of his heart that he's calling upon him for salvation. And Jesus, hey, it's not when I come into my kingdom. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So you see here, it's not People, when they talk about this topic of calling upon the name of the Lord, they get stuck into the how people call upon the name of the Lord. They get stuck into like, you know, I, I, didn't, I don't remember when I did, I didn't do it with someone, I didn't say it out loud. But those of us that believe you need to call upon the name of the Lord, we're not prescribing one way somebody must call upon the name of the Lord. It's not like you must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and therefore you must say every word on the back of this tract exactly the same way, you know, as, as, as like a Catholic prayer, right? Where you have to say these magical words and therefore you say, no, we're just saying that that person will communicate with God and there is a communication happening with God and therefore that's why calling upon the name of the Lord is required to be saved. Um, some other examples we'll look at quickly. This is the blind man that was healed and cast out of the temple. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. So you see how his faith manifested in words? When he said, Where is he that he might believe him? Jesus revealed, hey, it's me. He said, Lord, I believe. And I believe that's what happens. You know, that's, that's what Romans 10 is teaching. When somebody believes on the Lord, in their heart or out loud or however they do it, they are going to call upon the Lord. They're going to tell him something that they believe, that be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, you know, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Uh, the last one I'll show you here is in Luke 18. This is blind Bartimaeus. He was a guy that he was begging at the side and he heard that Jesus came by. It came to pass that he was come nigh unto Jer Jer Jericho a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. So he's like, why is everyone causing such a ruckus, right? And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. And he cried saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him saying, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. So you see here his faith, you see how his faith was manifested by him calling upon the name of the Lord. He was calling out to Jesus to, to receive his sight. And then he was brought to Jesus. Like we come to Jesus and he says, Thy faith hath saved thee. So he was saved by his faith, but his faith manifested in the fact that he called upon the Lord to be saved. So I believe it's a, it's a hypothetical that somebody sits in this no man land that they, that they believe on Jesus and yet they haven't communicated with him. Um, and like I said, it doesn't fit with Romans 10. I don't believe it's the same event because one happens after the other. So I believe the right position is, is that everyone that believes on Jesus Christ, they will call upon him. 
and, and I can see we can see examples of this in the scripture. And I think people that believed they believed without calling upon him are just unaware that they did because maybe they focused on a certain way in which to call upon him. But we're not saying that there is a prescriptive way of calling upon him. It's, we're just saying that there will be communication between the believer and God in order to receive salvation because they need to come to Jesus. They need to come to the Lord to be saved. And the only way you can do that is through, through calling upon him. Now, the last one I just want to touch on quickly is <coughs> people who are against calling upon the name of the Lord because they are really against just this whole one, two, three, repeat after me. And what do they mean by that? It means that when you go soul winning, you're not really thorough in your presentation. You're not really thorough in making sure that that person understands. You're just getting them to agree with a certain few points and then getting them to say a prayer ignorantly. They don't really know what they believe. They haven't really changed what they believe. They still believe that they're trusting their own works before and then we get them to pray. Now, that should not be a reason why somebody is against calling upon the name of the Lord when the Bible is clear about us having to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. The issue with one, two, three, repeat after me is that they're not being thorough, right? They're not making sure the person understands. And we even see in Romans 10 that it, it's not a faithless prayer, right? It's not that somebody's just repeating words, right? Just ignorantly in unbelief. And somehow through that ignorant unbelief, through saying these magic words that they're saved. No, we need to believe unto righteousness and then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the words alone, the prayer alone doesn't save you, but it's the prayer in faith. It's calling upon the Lord in faith that saves you. Because a lot of people, they call upon the Lord without the right faith, right? Like a lot of Catholics have prayed to the Lord or a lot of Orthodox have prayed to the Lord many times right? But if they pray believing that they have to work their way to heaven, then they're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not trusting him alone to save them when they call upon him. Um, so that's, that won't save them either. Now let's go to Matthew 13, verse 18. Yeah. When we look at the parable of the sower, and Jesus is explaining it, look at what he says. Here. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So you see, the first example is the person that hears the word. He doesn't understand it, right? And then the word is taken out of his heart. Now the next three, I don't think it's mentioned in the next two examples, but in the third example we see that there's an understanding that happens. But I don't think it's mentioned in these two because what he's talking about here is that, you know, they, 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 they go under persecution, which was one of them. Uh, he hath not rooted in himself, but dureth for a while, then there's persecution. Then there's one that he receives. I believe these both understand as well, but it's just not mentioned here. Seed among the thorns. Why? Because they, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, becometh unfruitful. Then in verse 23, we see here that when it's received, it's understood as well. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also, so rather than being taken away by persecution, rather than being taken away by the cares of this world, it brings forth fruit. Why? Because it's on good ground. So they receive the seed, they understand it, and it's received into good ground, and then it brings forth some hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. So an understanding is required. So the issue is not whether a prayer or whether calling upon the Lord is required for salvation. The issue is whether or not the person understands salvation, whether they understand what they are praying. So why do we include it? When, when I teach on the soul winning method, when we go soul winning, why do we include inviting somebody to call upon the Lord to be saved when we go soul winning because we know it's a necessary part of salvation, right? That's why we include it. It's not that that person needs to necessarily pray with me in order to be saved. It's just that knowing that the Bible teaches that they have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, I believe it's wise to be part of the soul winning method when we explain to somebody, when we lead them to Christ because it is a necessary part of salvation it's just part of being more thorough because think about it right if praying is a necessary step to salvation how is it more thorough when we are preaching the gospel to somebody to leave it out than it is to put it in obviously if it's part of it then we're going to leave it in to be more thorough we're not going to take it out to be more thorough it doesn't make sense so 
if a prayer if the prayer or calling upon the lord is necess is a necessary step to salvation we're not going to leave it out because that makes us less thorough right and if we know that salvation lies on the other side of calling upon the name of the lord why would if i'm trying to lead somebody to get saved why would i take them all the way up to 99 percent and then just leave them to do like i didn't leave them to get to 99 percent right why would i leave them to get to 100 percent? i want to try and get them all the way to 100 percent and get them to call upon the name of the lord to be saved so that doesn't make sense either you know if we're going to be thorough in how we win souls so that's why i'm not saying that that person has to necessarily pray with us to be saved and if they don't pray with us does that mean that they didn't get saved no because they obviously can call upon the lord themselves but me as a soul winner me as an ambassador of christ trying to be thorough and effective and trying to get them to understand what needs to occur in order for them to be saved why would i leave out that step when i know it's a necessary step according to romans 10 and according to the bible so <clears throat> does that mean people who don't pray with us aren't saved no but if they did get saved they would have called upon the lord at some stage i mean we don't know whether or not at some point when you were preaching to them they called upon the lord we don't know like if they say i'm not going to pray with you that yet they called upon the lord anyway or they only called upon the lord when you said hey well let's call upon the lord to be saved and at that point so you don't know so i kind of think of it this way right i try to explain it this way to people that you know just imagine there's a door and you have to walk through that door to be saved right and i'm here i'm standing with somebody explaining to somebody hey do you like do you believe that if you walk through that door that you're going to be saved and they say to me yeah they, they do believe that if they walk through that door they're going to be saved so if i then step away if i just stop at that point and i step away from the person what's the logical thing that they that they would do is if they believe that they're going to walk through that door right which is the calling upon the name of the lord to be saved because salvation's on the other side of that door but why why would i leave that up to chance why wouldn't i just you know if i love the person and i want them to be saved why wouldn't i say well you know you know you have to walk through that door do you want to walk through that door now that's all i'm doing when i say hey do you want to call upon the name of the lord and be saved right now do you want to ask jesus to save you is i'm not leaving them at that point where they just admit yeah i believe if i walk through that door i'm going to be saved and then it's like okay see ya no they say if i walk through that door i'm going to be saved why wouldn't i nudge them in the right direction and say hey well let's walk through that door let's make sure that we get saved so that's what i'm talking about when we say that's why we include it in the plan of salvation when we when we're explaining to somebody because it's not wise to just leave them at that point hoping that they'll go through there on themselves why don't we assist them and love them and say hey you know you just let's why don't we just walk through that door right now and be saved so you see here we're not saying that because if i'm explaining to somebody and say if you believe i'm explaining about the door and who the door is right the door is jesus they, they might at that point already have walked through the door they're like you know i've heard enough and walked through the door they're saved and i'm already here explaining to them but they're on the other side of the door already so that might or that might happen when we're preaching the gospel right or we might preach the gospel and say hey if you believe you walk through that door are you gonna you're gonna be saved they say yes and then they just walk through there without you that's great but we can't see that right because that happens in the heart so as a soul winner that i don't see what's happening in the heart and i want to be thorough in helping somebody get to salvation why would i not lead them all the way and just make sure hey i don't know whether you've walked through the door why don't we walk through the door now and if they say no you know we're not about pressuring people into praying but we ought to offer you know we ought to ask you know and help and it's all about being thorough this is the this is the point because you're asking why why do we do this it's, it's all about being thorough that's why when we explain somebody the gospel this is why we explain eternal security can somebody get saved without understanding that even if they were to commit murder even if they were to commit suicide they would still believe on jesus christ yes right if i'm explaining this door right and i say to somebody hey you walk through that door you're going to be saved that would be like saying hey if you believe on jesus you're going to be saved somebody can be saved right they can walk through that door with enough information and be saved but why do i talk about eternal security and say well hey you know what if you believe but then you do such and such sin or what if you you know you believe but you know and and you commit suicide and whatnot what am i doing if i'm using the door analogy it's because we know that there is a straight gate and we know that there is a wide gate which might be multiple gates right or wide gate. there's a bigger path that they could walk through so what am i doing when i explain to them about eternal security i'm making sure they're walking through the right door 
right? So because they, they, they might have called upon the Lord, believing and walking through the wide gate, but then they're not saved because they think they can lose their salvation. They're still trusting their works to be saved. They think that their works is what's keeping them saved, right? So I talk about those things to make sure they're going through the right door. So it's all about being thorough. If you think about it in that analogy, I want to make sure that they understand who the door is. I want them to understand that it's this door and not other, the wide door that everybody else thinks. That, you know, the Buddhist believes, on, believes in Jesus, but they don't really believe in Jesus. That's a wide door, right? It's another Jesus. So I want them to make sure it's this door. And then part of it as well is I want to make sure they walk through the door, right? Maybe they've already walked through the door, but I think it's wise as a soul winner to, to tell them, hey, let's walk through the door now. So that's why we include it. It's, it's about being more thorough. And I think it's just a wise way. It's just wisdom because we know that it requires calling upon the name of the Lord. That's why it's included. And people might say, well, if people can walk through that door anyway, even without praying, you know, calling upon the Lord with me, why then don't we count those people in our soul winning numbers? Why don't we count them as being saved, right? And honestly, that's just, that's just my preference. My preference is when, when we're counting the numbers and we're deciding whether or not to count somebody who's saved or whether they just heard the gospel and we're not sure, I just tend to be more conservative, right? Because I know that the Bible says if somebody believes they will call, so if somebody doesn't call upon the name of the Lord, I don't know, maybe they do believe and they're just uncomfortable praying with me. So I'm not saying that they can't get saved. But from my point of view, I would rather not count them as saved just because I don't know whether they're just telling me they believe, but they're actually lying. Because what actually ends up, what usually ends up happening is if somebody believes, they generally will call upon the Lord. You know, and if, and if, they, if they're uncomfortable, then uh, there's nothing I can do about that. But somebody usually what happens is when somebody says they believe that they're willing they're willing to say that to you like there's so many people that, that, that would just agree with you because they don't mind lying to you to just keep up appearance but when you when they actually have to then talk to god they know they can't fake it with god and there's that i think there's that conscience in us that we can't they can't just lie to god to his face and therefore they might just say well I, I don't, i'm not i'm not ready to pray i don't want to pray or I'm not willing to, to pray with you. I don't know always the reason, but when you ask why don't we count those people, it's just because we're being conservative. It's, I'm not saying that you know, the person that said that they believed isn't saved because ultimately we don't know. But for the purpose of recording the numbers and, and just getting an idea of how effective our work is being, I've just decided, you know, let's just be conservative because I would rather, you know, no, have more assurance that this person got saved because I witnessed them call upon the Lord to be saved rather than in the back of my mind thinking, well, did they really believe or were they just telling me that they believed um, if they weren't willing to call upon the Lord when I believe the two go hand in hand. Anyways, I hope, I hope you learned something. So basically, I hope this sermon helps clear up some of the debate. You know, I don't mind if you guys continue to talk about it, if you disagree with me. Um, that's my position, so I hope that makes it clear why I take that position, looking at all those scriptures. Um, and I hope it gives you the reasons as well why I promote inviting somebody at the door or when you preach the gospel to call upon the Lord to be saved, because I believe it's a necessary thing they must do. And that's just one way we can test whether they truly believe and helping, like I said, bring them through that door and be thorough in our presentation. And also, you know, why that's how we count the salvations. It's not that people can't get saved because they don't pray with us, but we just count it so that we're conservative um, and we're just more sure uh, of people that did call upon the Lord because we actually witnessed it ourselves. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, there's, there's so many different examples of... Um, you know, calling upon you and just how repentance, faith and, and, and calling upon you are intertwined. So we thank you, Lord, for giving us all these examples, helping us to understand. And it's, it's not an easy topic to understand. It's an important one, Lord, because it's just one that affects our very work, the main purpose of our church, which is to preach the gospel. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to, to understand, uh, help us to be wise in, in how we preach the gospel and help us to be effective, Lord, in, in when we preach the gospel. Um, that we are, are leading people all the way through to 100% and not uh, leaving it up to them to, 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 to take the steps themselves if we can assist them in any way we can. So we thank you, Lord, for this ministry you've given us. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to teach us from your word and, and bless the fellowship. 
Uh, we love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.